Okay, we're on, Joe. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I am honored to be here today with Dr. Kristen Fatima Butel. Um, and before I introduce her, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, we are live on YouTube right now. The recording will be available to watch at any time after we air, and we will have both Spanish and English captions probably within the next 48 hours. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions or comment. Just remember that in order to do so, you'll need to be logged into your YouTube account. And as always, we'd love to know more about you. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to let us know about yourself in the chat. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fatima Butel, who is an Associate Professor of Special Education in the Lynch School of Education and Human Development. She conducts research that characterizes social interactions involving autistic children, youth, and adults, and examines how home and school interactions can support learning and development. She also conducts research on quality and ethics issues in autism intervention literature. She's published more than 50 manuscripts, which have been published in top tier journals, such as Psychological Bulletin, Journal of Child Psychiatry and Psychology, and Autism, the International Journal of Research and Practice. Her research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, and she currently serves as a deputy editor for Autism in Adulthood. She has presented her research at national and international conferences on topics related to autism, special education, and social interaction. Dr. Bonima Butel directs the doctoral program in curriculum and instruction and the autism certificate program in the Lynch School of Education and Human Development at Boston College. Welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so I guess I will dive right in. My talk today is titled Autism Intervention Research Needs an Ethics Overhaul, Conflicts of Interest and Adverse Event uh, Reporting. Okay, so all right, so to give you an overview of my talk, I'm gonna start by talking about two studies we conducted on conflicts of interest. I'll open this first section by describing what conflicts of interest are and why they can be problematic for researchers. And then I'll go over two of the studies we conducted on conflicts of interest. One is on group design research and the other is on applied behavior analysis research. And then I'll switch and talk about adverse events. I'll again define what these are and why they're important to know about. And then I will talk about one study that we conducted where we looked at how studies report about adverse events. And this was again in group design research. And then I'll close with some um, overall conclusions from this work and some thoughts about what the future might hold. So to describe conflicts of interest, they are any relationship held by the researcher that makes it beneficial for them to show a particular finding about the intervention. In autism intervention research, this is almost always a finding that the intervention is effective. So conflicts of interest can be perceived, meaning that there are no actual conflicts of interest, but someone could reasonably assume that there are. They can be actual or they can be potential. So maybe the conflict of interest has not materialized yet, but it could in the future. And they can include things like financial incentives or personal relationships or ideological commitments. So you might be wondering, what are my conflicts of interest? So I would like to disclose that for this talk that I'm giving right now, I'm receiving a stipend. Um, so this is a speaker fee conflict of interest. Um, I have also co-edited a book on early intervention and autism that was published by Springer. And I receive royalties for those book sales. Um, I'm also in my capacity as an associate professor, I teach courses about autism uh, to students who want to become special educators. And in those courses, I cover autism interventions. I've also provided paid consultation to school districts in my area about autism intervention related topics. Um, and way long ago, before I became a professor, I worked in a school that supported autistic children, um, but this didn't use a particular brand of intervention approach. It was kind of an eclectic educational approach. And lastly, I've received grant funding um, to conduct foundational autism research so I haven't received any funding to conduct intervention research and have not actually conducted, I've only conducted, I think, one or two studies that could be called intervention research. Um, but much of my work is foundational, meaning that it could be used to develop or support um, the development of intervention research. And most of my work is situated in a developmental or constructivist theoretical orientation. So that gives you some insight into my ideological commitments. So now that you know this about my conflicts of interest, you might, um, 
give greater scrutiny to some of the methods that I share about how I do my work, and that would be completely warranted. So that's why it helps to disclose these issues up front. So conflicts of interest can be a problem because they can either advertently or inadvertently lead to research or bias that threatens research integrity. This is especially problematic if researchers don't disclose their COIs. Um, I'll use COIs as an abbreviation for so if you disclose your COIs, it's more likely that you're going to protect against them, which means you build procedures into the research design so that the COIs don't influence the research. If you don't disclose conflicts of interest, this can erode trust from the people meant to use the intervention. So if people who use an intervention find out later that there was a conflict of interest among the people who conducted it, they might decide that they're not going to, they don't trust the people who conducted that research anymore, and they're not going to use those interventions. So um, conflicts of interest are not something that I learned about as a graduate student. So you might wonder who in autism research is talking about this issue. Um, and I have here um, uh, the only uh, autism researcher who happens to be an autistic autism researcher who I know of who has been regularly talking about these issues for a very long time. So this is Michelle Dawson. Um, on the left-hand side, I have a blog post of hers. I think this one is dated from 2006. So she's been talking about this for at least 15 years. Um, this is a blog post. It has to do with ethics issues pretty broadly, um, but mentions conflicts of interest, especially undisclosed conflicts of interest. And she regularly talks about how it's not necessarily a problem to have a conflict of interest, but it is a problem if you don't disclose them. And this is a regular occurrence in autism research. So this on the left is from 2005. On the right is a tweet from Michelle from 2015. Um, she will regularly post articles that present intervention findings, but don't disclose um, conflicts of interest that are clearly there. Um, this tweet is from only a few weeks ago that has to do with stem cell research, and the researchers don't disclose any conflicts of interest, even though it's, it's apparent that they do hold them. So other than Michelle, I don't know of any other research, researchers prior to our work who um, published about or discussed these issues. So I'm going to start now by talking about some of our conflict of interest research that was really inspired by Michelle's, uh, Michelle Dawson's commentary. So the first study is a follow-up of a group design meta-analysis that was led by Michael Sandbank at UT Austin um, and co-led by Tiffany Wynorowski at Vanderbilt University. So a meta-analysis is when you combine all the studies you can find on a particular topic. and You combine uh, all of the results to develop what's called a summary effect. So for intervention research, you can use a meta-analysis to say, out of all of the research that we've ever conducted, what can we say about the, the intervention's effectiveness? So after we conducted this meta-analysis, we gathered all of the studies we could find on um, autism interventions for children up to the age of eight. And we didn't have any uh, restrictions on the type of intervention or the outcomes that they targeted. So we really covered everything. And we got 150 group design studies. Um, so as a secondary analysis, we re-examined all of these studies to see if we could find the prevalence of conflicts of interest among the researchers who published them. So we wanted to know how prevalent were COIs, of the COIs that we found, how many were disclosed. And then lastly, is there any evidence that authors who, um, or studies that are authored by researchers who hold COIs, do they have inflated effect sizes? And we used statistical procedures to determine if that was the case. So we had two methods of finding conflicts of interest. First, we just looked at the article. Was there a conflict of interest disclosure statement that told us directly about the, uh, any COIs the authors might hold? As you might guess, however, there weren't many disclosure statements. So we had to use another method, which was basically to just do a bunch of Google search. So to find uh, conflicts of interest that were not disclosed by the researchers in the article, we Google searched all of the author names and their institutional web pages to see if we could find any that weren't disclosed. In this group design study, we looked for eight different kinds of conflicts of interest. So first we looked for whether or not the researchers were also the developers of the intervention. As you can imagine, if you develop the intervention, you have a vested interest in showing everybody that the intervention you developed actually worked. Um, we also looked for researchers who are intervention providers, so they were paid to provide the intervention. 
or maybe they weren't paid to provide the intervention, but they're affiliated with an institution that has a clinic that provides the intervention. Um, the fourth one is if they worked at a, um, an institution that trains providers. So the, the most common occurrence of this were um, institutions that train board certified behavior analysts who, who provide behavioral interventions. So even if they didn't provide this intervention, if they trained other clinicians who do provide the intervention, we also consider that a conflict of interest. Uh, the fifth category was direct payments. So um, researchers who are also developers might have uh, written a book about how to provide their intervention and they might receive royalties for that book. We also included speaker fees here. Um, so if you um, like the, the uh, conflict of interest that I disclosed at the beginning of this talk, if someone has asked you to come speak about your intervention, that's a conflict of, inter of, uh, of interest if they pay you because you might be um, you you might have more opportunities to receive that kind of payment if you show that your intervention is, is effective. Um, we also looked for inter uh, for research that was funded by service providers. So those service provider providers might have reason to want to sway you to publish um, promising results about their um, about their uh, the service they provide. Um, and then the last two were intervention uh, funds the research or the study, sorry, the intervention funds uh, uh, subsequent research. So maybe the intervention isn't funding the current research project, um, but someone providing the intervention for pay is funding the researcher's future research. And then lastly, um, whether or not there was an author on the study that developed a measure that was being used in the study. So here are our results. So how prevalent were conflicts of interest and how often were they disclosed? So you can see in this table on the left that of the 150 studies, 105 of them, which is about 70%, um, had one of the eight CLIs, at least one of the eight CLIs. The intervention, um, the researcher being the intervention developer was the most common. Almost 50% of studies had the developer on the team of researchers. Um, clinic affiliations were also quite common, 20% of studies, direct payments where someone usually book royalties were the most common here. Um, uh, institution trades, trains others to use the interventions was about 14%. Clinical employment was about 13%. And then the three least common were um, the study used researcher created measures. Um, that was about 5%. Study funded by the service provider was about 3% and payments for the intervention fund the author's researchers uh, or fund the author's research was only about 2%. Um, but I want to point out that this table shows the conflicts of interest that we were able to locate. So this is probably an underestimate because there might have been conflicts of interest held by the research, uh, the research team that we were not able to find online. So of the conflicts of interest that we found, how many were disclosed? So only 15 of the 150 reports included disclosure statements but most of those were incomplete. Only six of those fully accounted for the COIs that we were able to locate. So overall, of the studies that had conflicts of interest, only 6% fully accounted for COIs in their disclosure statements, which is a pretty low rate. So we also wanted to know whether studies that had um, author COIs were associated with larger effect sizes. So we did something called a meta-regression where we compared all of these different COI types to the group of studies where we weren't able to find any COI. So statistically, there weren't any statistically significant differences between the eight COI types and the group of studies that had no COIs. However, we think that it would be very difficult to find statistical significance because we probably have a lot of what's called measurement error which means that the group of studies that we coded as having no COIs probably did have some COIs. And so we probably undercounted all of the um, uh, number of COIs in our eight different categories. So we think it's worth noting that the point estimates, the little dots you see here on this chart, are all larger than the group of studies with no COIs coded, even if they're not statistically significantly larger. The trend is that uh, effect sizes tend to be larger if the authors held a COI. So our conclusion from this study is that conflicts of interest are pretty widespread. They're underreported in this group of intervention research and they cover a range of intervention types. It wasn't just a single type of intervention um, where we found COIs, it was really across the board. So the study covered things, uh, intervention types like ABA, developmental uh, interventions like floor time, um, other types of interventions like teach were also in there, 
And across the board, they all had underreported COIs. Um, and we think that the presence of conflicts of interest probably results in inflated effect sizes, and this is likely due to researcher bias. Um, lastly, I want to point out that there is some gray area in terms of the types of conflicts of interest that journals say you have to report. So most journals have a conflict of interest policy and say that researchers have to report things like employment because that's a direct financial uh, transaction. So if you are employed as an intervention provider, the policies usually cover it. You have to report it. But things like institutional affiliations, where you work at an institution that trains um, people to be intervention providers, but you yourself are not an intervention provider, that's less clear if that's the, uh, the kind of relationship that a, a journal would require that you report. So even though we think there's underreporting, it's not necessarily the case that authors are violating journal policies in all cases. So a limitation of this study is that it only focuses on group design research, which means that um, a large group of participants are assigned to an intervention or a control group. Some research doesn't use a group design. They use what's called a single case design, where each participant acts as their own control. This type of design is used a lot in behavioral research. So because we excluded it from our original meta-analysis, um, even though there were behavioral studies, we excluded most of the behavioral research from our um, group design study on conflicts of interest. Because of that, we conducted a follow-up study. So we wanted to focus exclusively on uh, applied behavior analysis research, which we thought was important because so many services that um, autistic students receive, um, autistic children, youth, and adults, is ABA, especially in the U.S. Um, so um, the other reason that we focused on, uh, we focused at the journal level. So we selected journals that um, were specifically devoted to ABA research. And we thought this was a good idea because conflict of interest reporting and enforcement of conflict of interest policies is at the journal level. So in our original group design study, we had probably 100 different journals represented in that study. So it would have been hard for us to say that there are any trends in violations of journal policies because there were so many different journals represented. In this follow-up study, we only focused on eight journals so we could directly relate disclosure practices to journal policies. So for this second study, we also focused on one specific type of COI. So we focused on conflicts of interest where the researcher is an ABA intervention provider or provides paid consulta consultation to other ABA providers. We focused on this type of COI because it's an employment COI that is almost always explicitly stated in journal policies. So this is a kind of COI where there's no gray area. Um, it's very clear that if you are employed in this type of capacity, you have to report it as a conflict of interest. The second reason is that most researchers agree with this, that um, employment constitutes a direct financial transaction and needs to be reported as a conflict of interest. And lastly, uh, employment conflicts of interest are easy to find. And this is important because this means that we were not, um, there wasn't a lot of error in the way that we estimated their prevalence. So if it's a difficult conflict of interest to find, whatever we report is gonna be an undercount. So employment COIs, because people often ad advertise their employment on the web, we could find it by doing a Google search. So our research questions were that among the eight journals devoted to ABA intervention research, what was the prevalence of clinical and consulting COI autism related articles? Secondly, we wanted to know of the COIs that we found, how many were disclosed? And lastly, was the lack of disclosure in violation of any of the journal policies? So here is a table of the eight um, applied behavior analysis journals that we examined. The middle column tells you whether or not the journal was a COPE member. COPE is the Committee on Publication Ethics, and it provides guidance to journal editors about how to construct a conflict of interest policy and how to enforce it if the policy is violated by a researcher. The second column tells you if the journal actually had a COI policy that was available to authors. So we checked all of the author instruction pages, and we put a star here if we were able to find a COI policy. There was only one case where they were a COPE member, but we couldn't find a COI policy on the website. All of the journals that had a COI policy, the policy covered the employment COI that we examined. 
So if the, it, it covered the instance where the researcher was an ABA intervention provider or provided paid consultation to other intervention providers. So we looked at these eight journals and we examined all of the articles that were published over a one year period, starting in September of 2019 and ending in September of 2020. Um, we selected articles that examined an intervention strategy, reviewed a set of intervention strategies, or provided some evaluative commentary on intervention strategies. And they also had to have at least one autistic participant, either in a primary study or as part of the included literature in a commentary or review. Our search procedures were very similar to the group design study that I reported um, just a few minutes ago, except for that we focused only on the clinical and consulting COIs. So we found that uh, in that year period, 180 studies met our inclusion criteria, and we searched 501 author names. So there were 501 unique authors that published those 180 studies. Just over half of the authors we searched were found to have a clinical and or a training consultancy. 84% were authored by at least one person with this conflict of interest, more than three quarters. 58% um, of the studies did not include a conflict of interest statement. Almost 40% included statements that uh, declared that the authors did not have a conflict of interest. 3% included statements declaring conflicts of interest, which is extremely small, but only 2% accounted for the COI that we were looking for. I think the other, the COI statements mostly declared um, conflicts of interest related to book royalties. So only three studies said we have a conflict of, of interest because we are employed as ABA providers or consultants. Of the 70 studies that declared the authors had no conflicts of interest, almost 90% actually did have um, the clinical and consultancy COIs that we looked for. So here it, it, um, is just a, a table showing you our results by journal. So there's a star here if the journal actually had a COI policy that we were able to find saying that authors should disclose conflicts of interest related to employment. Um, so um, the articles with clinical and training COIs are reported here, the percentage for each journal. The psychological record only contributed one article. They only had one article that uh, met our inclusion criteria and it did not have authors with a conflict of interest. So if you leave out this article, the range of articles with authors who had clinical and consultancy conflicts of interest is somewhere between 75% and 100%. If you look at this column on the right, of the articles that had conflicts of interest statement, uh, conflicts of interest statements, here is the, the percentage of those that were false statements, saying that the authors did not have a conflict of interest, even though they did. So if you again ignore this last um, journal that only contributed a single article, the number of false COI statements ranges from almost 80% to 100%. Three journals had conflict of interest statements where all of them were inaccurate. So our conclusion from this second study is that the majority of researchers who publish in these ABA journals are also ABA intervention providers or consultants. Um, this COI was supposed to be disclosed. It was required in journal policies in five of the eight journals, but it was almost never disclosed. So another really alarming finding is the high prevalence of false claims of no COIs. So authors are taking the time to claim no COIs, even though they have them. So I want to tie this back into issues of study quality. So there have been several um, systematic reviews of both group design and single case design research across a range of intervention types that suggest study quality is low in autism intervention research. However, we know that it's possible to produce high quality research because there are some examples of really good quality research. Um, we think that design choices that reduce study quality um, and increase bias might improve if COIs are more readily disclosed and protected against. So um, an example would be if a researcher selected a measure to study their intervention that couldn't be administered to participants in a way that um, kept the uh, completer of the measure naive to group status. Um, and that's just a long way of saying uh, researchers often select measures that have placebo effects. 
So people know which group they're in. And if they're the one completing the measure, the measure is going to produce biased results. So researchers should select a different measure, one that they can um, administer in a way that keeps people unaware of what the, uh, of some of a participant's group status. But we found this kind of measures all over the place in the studies that we looked through. So I'm not sure why researchers are choosing to use these kinds of measures, but if conflicts of interest were more readily disclosed, they might um, make greater efforts to um, protect against these biases that are built into their designs. So here is a set of three images from different uh, systematic reviews assessing study quality. So this one on the left is the group design study led by my colleague, Michael Sandbank. And the two uh, here are single case designs. Uh, I think most of them are single case. Uh, the top one is single case design. The bottom one is group design studies of sensory-based treatments. And this one all the way on the right are um, psychoeducational uh, interventions. And I think most of these are single case designs. So anything that's not green in these two um, uh, images here means that it's uh, the proportion of studies with low quality. And over here, you can see all this black, which is uh, a, another low quality indicator. So this is, in my opinion, is, is bad. We, we can design studies that, are, that do better on these different quality indicators. Um, and the, the project AIM team who conducted this meta-analysis is doing a follow-up study right now tracking quality over time. And there's no indication that study quality has improved over time. So it's not as if we're just trying to catch up. Study quality used to be bad, but now it's getting better. Um, poor methodological uh, decisions in how studies are designed seem to persist over time. So there's no impetus right now for study quality to improve. So now I'm gonna switch to a different topic, adverse events. Um, so I'm first gonna describe what adverse events are and they fall into these three categories. So adverse events is kind of an umbrella term for any un unfavorable or harmful outcome that occurs during or after an intervention, but isn't necessarily caused by it. So um, an example could be that a, a child who's in a clinical intervention starts having problems in school. So it occurred at the time that the child was um, receiving the intervention, but it's not entirely clear if the two are related. And then there are adverse effects, where, which is an adverse event that can be plausibly attributed to the intervention. An example of this would be a child who um, is receiving a play intervention at a playground and they fall off a play structure and injure themselves in some way. It's pretty clear that the child would not have received that injury if they weren't participating in the intervention. And the last category is harm, which is a sustained deterioration during or beyond the intervention period. So it's not just a single occurrence, it's something that um, maintains over time and probably long after the intervention is over. So these things should be tracked because any intervention that has the potential to change some outcome in the child in a good way can also cause harm. So if we are confident that our interventions can improve the child, for example, improve their social communication abilities, it also has the um, potential to do the opposite, to make the child's communication abilities worse or cause some other type of adverse event. And unless we're actively monitoring for these kinds of events, they're gonna go unreported. Um, so researchers can't just conduct their study and say, oh, well, if anything bad happens, the participants will just let me know. That's not usually how it works. They have to actively monitor for adverse events in the same way they do for any other type of outcome. And this is important to know because it allows people who are using the intervention to make informed decisions about it. So if we understand what adverse events are possible, it will help us make a decision on whether or not the intervention is something we should do. For those of you who have, who have been following the development of the COVID vaccine, you might have um, heard about adverse events associated with that, which have been um, minimal, usually minor. And if you weigh it against the potential um, harms of getting COVID, most people decide, um, they make an informed choice that it's better to get the vaccine than to not get it. So just as I did in the conflicts of, of interest research, you might wonder who in autism research is talking about adverse events. And I have um, screenshots of two different studies that both talk about adverse events. The first one was published in the mid 70s and it's about um, electric shock therapy, um, the side effects of giving electric shock. Um, electric shock used to be common with behavioral interventions. It was only very recently banned by the FDA 
Um, it's used at the Judge Rottenberg Center or used to be used, uh, which is in Massachusetts. And that center is actually fighting to get the ban undone so that they can continue to use electric shock. Um, but this study wanted to know, is it worth it? Should, is there, are there any adverse events or harms associated with electric shock that would outweigh the benefits that we think um, exist from this treatment? So I wanna just read you the first paragraph of the discussion. It says, the reported side effects of shock with autistic children do not appear sufficient to rule out the use of this method of treatment. Although there is evidence to support the various contentions concerning temporary suppression, negative emotional effects, and increase in other undesirable behaviors, such evidence is minimal and does not characterize this treatment modality. The majority of unintended effects reported were of a positive nature. These included response generalization, increase in social behavior, and positive emotional behavior. So what this study did was just tally the side effects, and they said, is the side effect good or bad? And they decided that the tallies on the good side effects was larger than the tallies on the bad side effects. This is not generally how we think about adverse events. We don't just do a tally and decide which side has more tallies. We have to consider um, the gravity of the adverse effects, how severe they are. Um, and we have to be able to make uh, informed decisions about whether we think it's worth it or if the child would be better off without being at, put at risk for any of those adverse events. Um, so the second paper is a paper that was published in the 90s, and it also examined adverse effects, um, again, in regards to punishment, which was applied to autistic children, even in the 90s, but it was looking at the adverse effects on the researchers or the clinician, the interventionist providing the intervention. They did not have any concerns about whether punishment hurts the, the autistic children who received the intervention, but they wanted to know if it was harmful for the, for the clinicians who provided the, the punishment to the children. And they decided that and not only did it not hurt the clinician, it actually gave them a sense of self-efficacy. And the more um, uh, dramatic the punishment, the greater the self-efficacy. So they um, concluded from this study that punishment for autistic children is actually a good thing. And it affects interventionists in a good way. I think it's pretty, um, it's pretty telling that these are the only studies that I was able to find that looked at adverse effects in um, interventions for autistic children. And it just shows you the kind of ideologies that underpin uh, interventions for autistic people. Um, so I think that today, most people would think that this is pretty, this is not a appropriate way to think about adverse effects, either how they're measured, how they're conceptualized and how they're evaluated. Um, adverse effects should have a pretty low threshold if you think that there's possible of harm or um, um, adverse, uh, adverse reactions, we should take them very seriously. Um, and it shouldn't be um, limited to whether or not the clinician is the one experiencing those effects. So just as in the conflict of interest research, there is one autism researcher that I know of who happens to, again to be Michelle Dawson who is talking about adverse events. So here again is a blog, uh, an article from her called The Misbehavior of Behaviorists. And I think this one was also published in the early 2000s. Um, it's a favorite article among uh, lots of autism researchers and so many of you may have heard of it. Um, so she talks about a range of ethical issues in this article and one of them being how adverse events are not considered in the evaluation of, of uh, applied behavior analysis interventions. She also have some, uh, has some more recent tweets um, she um, tweeted here about how adverse events um, aren't consistently reported. Um, and then this tweet in the front, uh, this tweet was Michelle Dawson evaluating our project AIM meta-analysis, where we presented our conclusions about interventions, but didn't do anything in regards to um, whether or not adverse events were reported. So the impetus for my deciding to look at adverse events was really from Michelle saying, this was a huge flaw in your study, and it doesn't follow her words are very basic standards. And I think that she's right. Looking at adverse events and harms is a very basic standard, but it's so um, ignored in autism research that it's not something that I even knew about before Michelle Dawson pointed it out to us. So our impetus for this third study was again from her commentary saying, this is a huge oversight and you need to go back and need to look at these things. So that's exactly what we did. We looked at all 150 studies that were included in the project AIM meta-analysis and we asked four research questions. So we wanted to know how many studies recorded adverse events. Of the studies that did monitor adverse events, what proportion determined that they actually occurred? 
Of the studies that provided reasons for participant withdrawal, how many reasons could be classified as an adverse event? And how many studies reported negative effect sizes? So the reason we asked these second two questions is because we had a feeling that just like conflicts of interest, adverse events were gonna be underreported. So we, we needed to look for them in places that were not um, official adverse event reporting. So um, reporting reasons that participants exit the study, researchers don't generally call them adverse events, but they're more readily reported than, than things that are labeled as adverse events. So we wanted to see if we could find those reasons and if we could code any of them as being um, meeting the definition of an adverse event. And the fourth one was another kind of um, tricky thing that we did. Most, oftentimes, a researcher will hypothesize that an intervention will improve some outcome, but sometimes it does the opposite and it has a negative effect on the participants who are in the treatment group. So we wanted to tally all of those studies that reported a negative effect um, and determine how many of those we would call an adverse event. So for this, for this final study, we um, searched all of the PDFs that, were, uh, that we had gathered for our 150 project aim study. And we searched for the terms adverse, adverse effect, side effect, complication, harm, attrition, withdrawal, and dropout. And we also scanned the methods and figures to see if we could find any reasons um, that were reported for either participant withdrawal or adverse event. Um, we coded all of the studies. Um, they were either coded as that they did report adverse events, they reported that no events occurred, or um, they didn't report this information at all. We then coded all the reasons for withdrawal, um, either as an adverse event, effect, or neither, and many of them were too vague to determine either way. For example, some studies would say, the participants withdrew from the study because they left the study, which is basically giving us no detail where we can determine whether it was an uh, adverse event that caused them to leave. Um, and then to find negative effect sizes, we searched our database from our original study. Um, we restricted the negative effect sizes to randomized control trials because it's easier to make a causal determination. So randomized control trials are really good for deciding if the intervention was the cause of the change in the child. And we wanted to make the case that the negative effect sizes was an adverse event caused by the intervention. So we, we only looked at the randomized control trials. So our findings were that um, only about 7% of the studies in Project AIM discussed an adverse event. 36% um, of those reported that an adverse event had occurred. 36% um, of the studies, so much more, provided reasons for participant withdrawal. 44% we didn't code as adverse events. 19% um, we coded uh, as adverse events and 15% we couldn't make a determination because they were too vague. Oh, sorry, 15% provided reasons that were adverse effects and then 22% were too vague for us to make a determination. In terms of negative effect sizes, there were 87 randomized control trials in that study and 11% of them were negative, meaning that the intervention made the outcome worse. So of all 150 studies that were included in Project AIM, um, none of them describe systematic procedures for monitoring adverse events, and no studies report or reported or discussed long-term harms. So none of them were following the participants long enough to be able to determine if a harm had occurred. So if, um, to give you some examples of the kinds of adverse events that we found in these studies, um, they were things like child health issues, one study um, tested hyperbaric oxygen therapy and reported that there was some ear trauma as a result of um, participating. Caregiver anxiety during caregiver mediated interventions was coded in a few. The reasons for withdrawal included things like children health issues, distress or dislike of the intervention and family crises. And the negative effect sizes um, covered a, a whole range of domains, including social communication, language, play, restrictive and repetitive behaviors, what people call challenging behavior um, and social emotional domains. So I think it's interesting that um, the two core domains of autism are included here, social communication and restrictive and repetitive behavior. And the intervention made scores on um, assessments, uh, assessing these domains worse in the intervention group. So we think it's worth pointing out that none of the studies seriously considered the potential benefits of the intervention in light of the potential harm. 
Um, as I mentioned in our methods, we had to kind of dig to find these adverse events. A lot of them were not labeled as, um, they, were, um, they weren't labeled as adverse events and they weren't discussed as such in the discussion. Um, the negative effect sizes where the strongest case can be made that the intervention caused the um, iatrogenic effect, which is an, another way of saying negative effect size, the researchers either explained it away as superfluous, like this is just an artifact of the data and it's not really real, or they didn't mention it at all. Um, there were at least two studies where the effect sizes were negative and you couldn't find any mention of those outcomes in the discussion section. Um, so our conclusion in this study is that adverse events, even though they're not systematically monitored um, they're, and rarely reported, they do occur. Passive monitoring, um, where uh, a participant will simply tell the researcher that something has happened, even though the researcher hasn't asked, um, and reporting reasons for withdrawal that count as adverse events and iatrogenic, event, uh, iatrogenic effects, these are all documented, um, and they're relatively common. Um, it's not as if we only found it in, you know, one or two percent of studies. It was actually, a, um, you know, between 10 and 30 percent of studies had something that could be counted as an adverse event. Um, but because we don't have good information about how common these things are, it's impossible to make suggestions for services that allow you to weigh the benefits with potential harms. We really don't have any idea if there are any long-term negative impacts of participating in, their, in an intervention because nobody is doing this work where you follow up students or you follow up participants to determine if, if long-term harms have occurred. So what's next? Um, the title of this talk, the subtitle is that autism intervention research needs an ethical overhaul. So it seems that the lack of reporting of these issues has to do with the cultural norms in this field. So there has to be some sort of large scale shift in order for things to change. Um, reporting conflicts of interest and the strategies researchers use to protect against the bias that these conflicts of interest cause um, has to be more readily disclosed. We have to make sure that there are some built-in procedures so that we don't have um, studies that have increased bias due to these conflicts. Um, and the same for adverse events. They have to be actively monitored for and more readily um, reported. Um, and this has to be during the intervention period and, and at least um, you know, several months after the intervention has ended. And I just want to emphasize that these are ethical conduct issues. Um, so they're serious and they should cause um, some serious concern among a whole variety of stakeholders. Um, funders should um, have funding contingencies where you only receive funding if you build in procedures to report, to monitor and report for adverse events, if you readily disclose your conflicts of interest and you tell us what procedures you're gonna use to protect against those conflicts, which could be things like if the um, researcher is an intervention provider, that researcher doesn't have anything to do with data collection or data analysis. Journal editors have to be better at insisting that these kinds of things are reported appropriately. Researchers have to be better about readily disclosing these issues and policymakers have to take these things into account. So just because there are studies that look good and, and show that an intervention is effective, has the study appropriately reported conflicts of interest? Has it appropriately reported um, adverse events? And if it, ha if it hasn't, we might wanna reconsider building policies that support the use of those interventions. So I don't know if there's going to be big changes after um, our recent work on conflicts of interest and adverse events, um, but I have some things that have um, happened on social media uh, and, and elsewhere since these um, studies have been published. On the left, I have a casual Twitter conversation with an ABA researcher who um, asked me, I have a book that I get royalties for. How do I cite this as a conflict of interest? And I didn't include this full thread, but other ABA researchers chimed in and said, I know my field has been doing very poorly at this and I wanna improve. Can you give me advice about how to report X, Y, and Z? Um, this uh, screenshot right here is from a study that was um, uh, an autism intervention study that was uh, first authored by Dr. Tony Sharman. And I know you can't read it, but this is the conflicts of interest statement, which is enormous. And in our 
um, project aim study, we didn't see any conflict of interest statements that were this comprehensive. So it could be that people are more readily disclosing their conflicts. Um, and I hope that's the case. I, I hope to see more conflict of interest statements that are this big. Um, here's a, a, a tweet from Dr. Andrew Whitehouse about ethical violations in relation to um, stem cell research. So stem cell research that isn't disclosing conflicts of interest and isn't appropriately monitoring adverse events. And he's wondering, they don't do this in other fields. Why are we allowing this to happen in autism research? And I think it's, um, I think it's good to see that autism researchers are taking ownership of this. This is something that our field has to fix. This last tweet on the right is from my colleague and co-author, Michael Sandbank. Um, this is, uh, uh, was tweeted during the um, International Society for Autism Research Conference. And Dr. Tony Sharman was one of the keynote speakers. And he mentioned adverse events in our, our study on adverse events in that keynote speech, or one of the keynote speeches, um, which I think is really important. So it's, it's getting attention and, and prominent autism researchers are saying to the field at large, these are things that we have to improve. So there is at least more people talking about these issues than there were in the past. And I hope that it actually results in some real um, material changes for how autism research is conducted. Um, so before I close, I just want to thank and acknowledge my collaborators. Shannon Crowley is my doctoral student and she was my right-hand person for all three of these studies. She was very active in the project development and coding all the studies and uh, uh, running our results. Michael Sandbank led Project AIM. Um, Tiffany Wynerowski is one of the co-PIs on that project. And the rest of the Project AIM team, um, including Mark Cassidy, Casey Dunham, Jacob Feldman, Jenna Crank, Suzanne Alderon, Svia Raj, and Prakti Mabu. And with that, I will thank also to the organizers, Dr. Elizabeth Torres and the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence for hosting, and to Jen Potter for arranging the event. I have my contact information here in case anyone wants to send an email. Um, but I think that we do have some time for questions that I would be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Dr. Torres will be coming on as well. Um, I'll start. If I could just say that that was incredibly eye-opening and disturbing and infuriating. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to see that there are some changes happening, but the first thing I wanted you to start with actually is um, I know like you've learned so much from Michelle Dawson, I have as well. And one of the things that I've heard you say about her is that she kind of taught you that um, conducting high quality research is a social justice issue. So would you just talk about that a little bit first? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think that um, um, she says a lot in, in uh, her social media posts that this kind, these things harm autistic people. Yes. Uh, you know, not just the harms that can occur as a result of an intervention, but allowing low quality research to persist and doing nothing about it is um, disenfranchising an entire group of people. And um, what is the reason that we're allowing this to persist and nobody is saying we have to stop, we have to really seriously change things. Um, because I don't think this is new, you know, as you saw, a lot of this stuff has been yeah. going for decades and decades. I would go so far as to say that it's sort of the foundation of this field. Um, the first autism yeah. uh, interventions were built around aversives. Um, you know, electric shock is part of the um, initial treatments for autism. We sort of, um, I don't think we've really grappled with that, that we have some serious cleaning up to do. Um, and if in our refusal to do it is complicity in, in, an, in a social justice issue, um, not just, uh, you know, allowing these harms to continue, but um, allowing poor quality research to inform our service delivery. Yeah. And in, in addition to that, you know, this generation of adults who are reporting many adverse events and harm that have been done to them through a variety of approaches and, you know, interventions, and it largely, they're being ignored. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, um, I think that, um, Autistic autism researchers, I think, are obviously more keyed into these issues than non-autistic uh, autism researchers like myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think my, um, I'm in my 10th year of being a faculty member doing autism research, and this was not on my radar before two years ago. Um, so I don't want to pretend that I um, 
you know, came into being knowing about all of this stuff. I didn't. It's something that I had to be um, taught by other um, people, you know, an, an autistic autism researcher who um, has been keyed into these issues. And I feel like they've kind of been screaming into the void. And I'm not really sure why this issue hasn't been more readily taken up. I think they're all related, though. I think the conflict of interest issue keeps these other things from coming to the forefront because people yeah. say, you know, I want to protect my own interests. I don't want to deal with all of these other ethical issues that are plaguing the field. So it's just sort of this feedback loop. So I, I want to say something about that because um, I, I came through a different path altogether uh, to this information and, and to be curious about it myself. And it's through the path of distinguishing subjective opinion-based versus objective physical measurements-based science. And often this distinction uh, is not is not really available to the reader or to the or to the people that are participating or to even to the parents. And so they're calling they're the calling science both of these things is dangerous because it puts other researchers that do a different type of science at risk of being considered in the same kind of research that is being subjective. And so to be more precise, everything that has been described there and that has been done is based on observation. It's pretty much someone visualizing something, somebody observing something and viewing something and creating a scale, say from one to 10, like a Likert scale and saying it's a 10 or it's a nine or it's a seven arbitrarily without any proper metric, without any proper normative data set even, like any of these measurements uh, are not normative. They, they are uh, criterion based. Uh, which means that you, as a researcher in that field, you decide what the what the uh, what the ruler is, what the metric is that you're going to be talking about. Then you do research on that without any kind of a standardization. The standardization that is being done is in, inappropriate. It's statistically incorrect and it's inappropriate. And compare many times. Apples and broccoli, I, I joke, because it has nothing to do with what's inside the body of that child that they are subject to all these uh, interventions. Interventions intervene, and so they change the system, but they're not taking a measurement, a physical measurement of how that system is reacting. And so simple measurements that could be available at this point are heart rate variability and all the elements that uh, go with that. Cortisol levels in saliva because that gives you stress levels, sweat pattern because that also speaks of a stress and anxiety. Movements, tremor and hidden movements that reflect the anxiety of the child. And then importantly, the status of the reward circuits, circuits of the brain that they are impacting before and after the intervention because hidden to the naked eye is the rewards that they're providing. So we're talking about the, the other extreme of punishment, you know, electric shocks or punishment regimes. But let's talk about the positive reinforcement regimes that we have in these interventions, which are based on, on food that can't go into the, into the body. That is an invasive reward uh, that goes with sugar, gluten, and other allergens that could be impacting the metabolism of that child. And this is not discussed at all. So I would like to make that distinction between the researchers in autism that primarily rely on measurements that are subjective, that are opinion-based, and, and that don't even um, abide by a general consensus of inter-rated reliability because primarily you have case studies. And with case studies, you cannot do large uh, scale uh, studies of interrated reliability. So to begin with, that's an absence, a uh, complete absence in the whole uh, process. Um, so, I mean, if, if you could co comment on that a little bit, because it's an aspect of, of the um, adverse events that are completely hidden to the naked eye. And the foundation of it is this observation method 
that doesn't um, account for what is physically actually going. And the physical measurements that acts like a neutral observer because it is what it is. It doesn't depend on your opinion. Um, and that neutral observer is absolutely absent from all of it. Oh, that's, yes. So I think there's a lot to unpack in that really important comment. Um, so one thing that we did when we assessed, and, and this is part of our ongoing research, is to assess study quality. There's something called detection bias. So that is the bias that occurs when the researcher knows the whether or not the child is receiving the intervention that they're observing. So protecting against detection bias is very difficult if the researcher is the one doing the measurement, as you said, and they know if the child is in the intervention phase or in the treatment phase because they're the ones providing the treatment. So when you have a research team where no one is kept naive to what's, you know, whether the child is in treatment or control, you're going to have these issues. So for me, it's not necessarily an issue. I do observational research all the time. I don't necessarily do it in the intervention study, but I'm interested in things like social interaction. So observing is an important part of my um, toolbox, I guess. But I think you're absolutely right that detection bias is a serious problem that's really compounded when the research team is not um, made up of anybody who is unaware if the child is receiving treatment or not at the time they're doing the observation. That almost never happens in single case design research because the observations are either when the child is receiving treatment or when they're not. And you can see, you can see the person there providing the reinforcement. So it's no secret. You, it's very difficult to keep that naive for the rater, whether or not they're in the treatment. So that's one issue. Um, the other issue you mentioned is validation. So I think observational measures can be validated, but I think you are right that they almost never are. So one example would be for a research um, uh, intervention research project where they measure something like eye contact and they call that social communication. Mm -hmm. Is eye contact a valid part of the construct social communication? Another thing that I see all the time is prompted initiations. So I told the child to say hello and then they did. And then the researcher will call that social communication. In my opinion, that is not a construct valid measurement of social communication. It's not connected to that domain. There's no psychometric assessment of what this is. It's sort of just made up by the researcher and then put in that domain. So I think what can happen is that a researcher will say, this study made improvements in social communication. And then you'll look at the measure and you'll say, what does this have to do with social communication? And they're just sort of these um, observational um, um, tallying of discrete skills that in my opinion, don't have anything to do with that domain because it's not developmental and the social communication domain is a developmental domain. So I think that um, what you referenced as objective measures, I think can be import, uh, an important part of this. I do think it's possible to have objective and psychometrically valid observational measures, but you rarely see those in certain, you, you, they're not, we don't have very good ones, um, but I think that theoretically we can improve the measures we have so that they can be construct validated, um, they can be delivered in a reliable way, and they can be delivered in a way that the uh, assessor is naive to the treatment status. So it would have to be an observational assessment that did not occur in the intervention context. There's all kinds of limitations if you do it that way. And, and we, we, we absolutely should have people from other fields. It's a, it's a very complex disorder. So you yeah. need an interdisciplinary, broadly uh, construct team of people who yes. have no skin in the game. There, are, there should be people from other fields who have nothing to do with autism research who will not benefit in any way from it, but have the technical knowledge to actually say something and call it off. And we don't have that, unfortunately. I think that's absolutely right. And I think the um, benefits of that, as you say, would be one that we're just going to improve our conceptualization of what's going on because we're going to have more um, different disciplines kind of sharing expertise. And what you said about not having skin in the game, I think is right on because I think we need, I think we have too many vested interests in our field where, you know, people only study their own intervention that they develop. You should, you shouldn't pass off your intervention to your postdoc and say, well, now it's an independent assessment. It should be someone who really doesn't have a vested interest in that intervention that can make a unbiased assessment if, if it has any benefit. 
Yeah, and in particular because declaring a conflict of interest, I mean, should be by default what we all should do, but doesn't necessarily deal with the bias, with the potential bias that the conflict of interest can create in the research. So every paper that declares conflict of interest should also have a section explaining precisely how that conflict or potential conflict of interest biases what they're doing, their measurement, the design, everything, so that the reader is informed and at least has a, an option to I mean, opt for it or not. Yes, absolutely. So not even just that they're explaining the bias, but they say, because we're so biased, the researcher who, I've seen this before in other fields, where the researcher will say, um, so-and-so is on the research team, they develop the intervention, they have an intervention manual that they make money from, so they were not permitted to collect or see any of the data or even interpret it. They were partitioned from that part of the study. All they did was train the intervention providers, and then they were you know, shuttled away, and they, they didn't participate in the design anymore after that. I think we need to do that. If we have intervention designers on the research team, they need to be kept separate from the data. And that procedure for keeping them separate needs to be in the protocol. It needs to be in the method section. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions and I have a few questions myself. Um, so I have, well, I have a few things. Okay. So one of the questions we did get from Zach Sidik was, would causing trauma or mental distress be considered an adverse effect in autism research, or does that come down to the specific researchers? And just to um, like add on to that with my own thoughts is that um, regardless of what, of how good or poor the current intervention research is, we do have a lot of quality research from other fields like relational neuroscience and you know, people who study trauma and things like that. We know much more about the nervous systems and the, and the brain that we do than we ever have before. So like adverse effects and, and harm don't have to be things that are like um, explicitly aversive in the moment. Like for instance, withholding warmth or attention can, be, can cause harm to a child's development. We, we know that through child development research. So um, what are your thoughts on, like, are people studying trauma at this point in relation to the interventions that are being done? Because most times autism gets blamed. Yes, but right. We, are, we never examine what, what's actually being done to them that could be causing these. And I think that's part of what you were getting at earlier. Yes. Definitely. So to answer the first question, I think it was um, um, mental health effects. Um, would causing trauma or mental distress be considered an adverse effect in autism research? Or does that come down to the specific researchers? So that's a great question. And I like it because it's framed in the perfect way. So one is, is it an adverse effect? But it's really, do autism researchers consider it to be one? Mm. No, because, because nobody is there are so few studies that even mention adverse effects. I would say absolutely. If you look at the definition of adverse effects, that absolutely counts and it should be um, considered in every intervention study um, because it definitely counts. I can't tell you that other autism researchers agree because I haven't seen anybody monitor for it. Mm -hmm. So I like that question a lot and how it was framed because it it is an adverse uh, effect, but no, I don't know if my if, if many of my colleagues are aware or agree that this is the case. I think that it's probably true that it's going to take some innovation to really track those things. Um, you know, we're going to have to have funding to, to, to study people and track um, trauma and mental health effects over time. Some of the feedback that I've gotten is exactly what you said, Jen, is, is how do we know this isn't just a feature of autism? You know, autistic people might be more, um, have a, a, a higher proclivity or, or more susceptible to depression. Um, so it probably will be difficult to, dis, to tease out if it's related to intervention services or if it's just related to being in an ableist society where it's very difficult to simply be as an autistic person. Yeah. Um, I think we can do this. I think we can we can determine um, over the long term if participation in an intervention 
um, is associated with decreased or with increased um, mental health problems. Yeah. Um, so I had another question as well. Um, so parents are bombarded with claims of evidence-based as soon as they realize their child is autistic. Um, we hear from a lot of families that like doctors and schools and therapists are pushing certain interventions, even if the family doesn't have insurance coverage, even if they don't want the service. And there is almost never uh, an acknowledgement of potential adverse effects coming from the actual providers either. And right. so, so that's problem number one. Um, and the same goals goes for even, you know, at a more micro level is particular goals that are being worked on um, or, you know, particular strategies. Um, so my thing is because, you know, I'm a, a, a parent, I know how vulnerable especially new parents are for parents of newly diagnosed children. Um, and, and this was something that even took me years. It's like, in addition to learning that there's all these conflicts, which we have a right to know so that we can make decisions, but there's also a lot of information withheld about um, the study groups. And so like for me, for instance, uh, things that were proposed to me as evidence-based were not, were not, um, those studies did not include people like my child. And so therefore they don't even apply um, as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but so, you know, so the parents have like various people pushing certain interventions. Um, and like, so in light of these conflicts and in light of evidence that we have with the nervous systems and everything that I mentioned before, don't the clinicians also have a responsibility to know about and disclose this? And what advice do you have for families? I know you said before that it's impossible to make interventions like based on the information available, but what do we do? <laughs> oh, I wish that my colleague, Michael Sandink was here because she wrote a paper. She will be here, by the way, in September. Awesome. So you should <laughs> take that question for her. I think that she, that her, um, she just uh, was the first author on a, a paper that we recently had accepted that answers this question. And I think that her um, biggest piece of advice that, is that we have to listen to families and what they want. Mm -hmm. We have to do away with the blanket recommendations. And, and one of the big things that we found in, 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 the, um, in the projects that she led for Project AIM is the recommendation of 40 hours a week. So there are, that's just an example of a supposedly evidence-based recommendation is that children need 40 hours a week of intervention. It's, I think we couldn't quite pin down the exact um, location of where that recommendation came from, but our um, meta-analysis of 150 studies, we didn't find associations between intervention intensity and outcome. So it's not the case that more is always better. So mm -hmm. to family, you have to devote the majority of your waking hours to doing this is really bad advice. Yeah. There's no evidence base for it. And it could seriously disrupt families' lives. Yeah. I think that um, what one of the things that that um, Michael Sandbank really wanted to clarify is that we need to develop our recommendations in collaboration with families because it needs to be individualized, which we say all the time. But you're right, we're not super good at explaining participant characteristics of studies. And there's something called a moderator analysis that helps us determine what study or what interventions work for for whom. So it could be, for example, that this kind of interventions work really good if kids are at this developmental level. If they're not at that developmental level and they get this kind of intervention, it actually does the opposite. We only have like a dozen moderator studies where we've actually looked at particular characteristics of the participants and said, which ones does it work for? So we need to do more of that kind of work. Um, I think that we pretend that we know, like, you know, we, we use individualized all the time, but we don't actually have really good information about how to do that. So I think we have to use family's knowledge. We have to say, well, what do you know about what your child likes and how can we tailor what we um, know about interventions to your family's goals and what you want? But telling families, you know, you got to do 40 hours a week, you got to do ADA, we do not have the evidence base to make that recommendation. And, and how do we, sorry, Liz, I was just going to say, how do we help bridge that gap with the medical providers too? Because to me, that's a huge area of need. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think communication has got to improve between researchers doing the um, you know, primary research studies. And, and so the article that I'm thinking of that Dr. Sanding was the first author on was in a medical journal. So I think that, you know, kind of crossing those um, divides, maybe researchers need to get involved in more policy work where, um, you know, policies that inform what medical provider, you know, what the, 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 um, the first people that, that um, families get advice from um, telling them what they know. I mean, I, I would be lying if I said I really knew the answer to that, um, but I would like to, you know, researchers who study um, research to practice gaps, first you have to agree on what the research says. You know, I know yeah. there's like implementation science people who want to um, study how evidence-based interventions are used in schools, for example. Um, I, I am very skeptical of that work because I don't think we have a good evidence base yet. Um, there's all kinds of things that go unexamined. It's not just the quality of the study itself, it's the quality of the outcome. I right. think, people, you know, as Dr. Torres said, people will look at an outcome and act as if it's, this will change a child's entire social communication domain. And then you look at what the outcome actually was, and it's like, no, that's actually very limited. I have no reason to think that that outcome is particularly meaningful. Um, so I think there's a whole range of things that have to be done. We, we, we have to focus on getting our primary evidence in order and then we can be better positioned to make recommendations. I mean, I, I would just wanna ask families, how can I support you and your child? Like, what, what do you need? And then I can try to help, you know, practitioners can help think of how to, how to get it for them. One last thing I wanna add is that another thing that I, um, I'm pretty sure I got from Michelle Dawson is that any recommendation you have that is gonna take an autistic child and say, you need to have a mountain of evidence showing that that has any benefit. So if yeah. you take a, a, a child out of school and put them in a clinic where they're getting one-to-one -one services, you better have a really good reason for doing it. Because otherwise you're just segregating a population of students without yeah. good um, reason to, to show that it's, it's worthwhile and it's just promoting segregation. And I also would like to uh, clarify there that uh, IRB approval for a study it should also be scrutinized because there are IRBs that you can privately buy or at clinical settings. And those don't have the same kind of rigor necessarily than the ones in the academic settings. Uh, in the academic settings, when you get a grant, you have to declare all potential conflicts of interest. And there's a commission that follows these. In my portfolio at Rutgers, I have to declare this by default. And it's part of the IRB office that does that. When I uh, apply for an IRB for a particular study that is funded by a particular grant, I have to declare all potential conflicts of interest there. And also all the adverse uh, effects, potential adverse effects, and not just uh, the immediate ones that are obvious during the during the study, this is not an intervention study. This is like a basic science study. So we should make that distinction there. In a basic science study, you, you have a very strict IRB protocol at the academic level. It's not necessarily the same as a clinical IRB or an IRB that was bought privately through a private company. So this, these are different things and are subject to different standards. We have to consider not only the immediate adverse effect, potential adverse effect that our study could cause. For example, one example is that you put a sensor on the child and he doesn't want it. Okay, so you just stop right there. There's not, nothing else to do and you have to declare it. You have to actually communicate it. But also the long-term effects that parents may communicate to you from the study. There might be some trauma that you didn't see. Or even in the data that you're collecting, which is physical data, you may discover something and you have to report it. This was particularly uh, harmful to the child because he was stressed by this and this and that. And so it's a different a standard uh, what is required from the research in the basic science domain that is doing physically based measurements and the research uh, and, the, and the standards that are required from a researcher that is doing primarily observational. And I'm not saying observational is bad because we all do it. This is absolutely vital to any research enterprise. But when it's only, uh, you know, based on, on that type of data, particularly when you're intervening in a system that is developing, it's, it can be harmful. 
um, and as, as is proven or, already by the trauma that is caused, that some of these therapies have caused to the adults that are reporting it to us. And uh, could, could this have been prevented if we had, you know, that, that's a question that will haunt us forever. Could, could this have been prevented if we had had measurements that tell you, you know, the changes in temperature, the changes in cortisol, the changes in, in heart rate variability and so forth that that child was experiencing at the moment of the intervention study, right? We don't know, right? But it's the future is that we should know. And so we should correct, we should make a major correction on that and, and pay attention to the type of IRB behind the study. That should be disclosed as well. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think you're right. Um, for some reason, there is a um, misunderstanding that interventions that don't in draw, uh, involve some uh, like physical device or um, pharmacological substance don't have risk for adverse events. Yeah. That, I think that's true in the psychological literature more generally. Um, I, maybe it's worse in autism research that um, because many of our interventions are um, psychosocial and not pharmacological, um, that there's a much higher threshold in those fields than there are. I think there's, and so that's the, the, the first point I made that if your intervention can change behavior, it has potential to harm. Um, just because you're not giving a drug using some sort of medical device does not mean you don't have potential to harm. But there is a drug involved, which is sugar. Right. For some of these, yeah. Yeah, right. So, I mean, th that's the thing that is so subtle that we think, oh, it's, it's not harmful at all. But it is an intervention. It is invasive in the sense that you are ingesting something. It goes into your body. And, and even even in an instruction that may seem very harmless could be harmful if, if the child's nervous system is in such a state of flight or fight that it will cause even more, more uh, stress, more anxiety. And how do we know that if it's not being measured? That's right, right exactly. It's being it eyeballed. Be, you're right, it has to be actively measured, not just well if they happen to tell us they didn't like it. Yeah. Um. That's a great point. And uh, probably a good example of that is focusing on eye contact because we know that that is overwhelmingly not something that seems helpful and many people report as harmful. Yes, and I think the um, use of eye contact in non-autistic people is very misunderstood. And, yeah. You know, a, a very atypical form of eye contact is promoted in interventions that try to do stuff like that. Or, or yeah. touching the child, you know, the hand over hand thing, touching the child could be very harmful to the child, uh, you know, sort of perception of what it's an invasion of their private space. Autonomy, yeah, right. Yeah. Which again is related potentially to the long-term abuse rates, um, right. you know, having much higher rates of sexual and physical abuse. Again, what are the reasons for that? And why isn't, why aren't more people really examining the factors that influence those types of things. Um, I wanna get to a couple of the questions. So from Blogger Music Man, uh, what do your findings about ABA research mean for the greater effectiveness of ABA as a practice? And he says, I know you can't jump too ahead of, ahead of the research, but as best as you can answer. And then a follow-up, If do you want me to wait for the follow-up or? Sure. <laughs> I guess just to that part, um, I, again, I, I love the framing of these questions because I think you're right. Our study uh, right now was not on ABA quality, but we inferred from studies, the few studies that have assessed quality. One thing I just want to parse out is that um, ABA is mostly examined in single case design research. Not all of it. Some of it is group design research. But I make that separation because you have to look in different places to find the single case stuff. And there's different quality assessment tools for that research as compared to group design research. Um, so I think as far as what I know, across the board for, for most interventions, the quality is not high enough to know about effectiveness. I think the examples of really high quality interventions are not in the ABA field, the, the, the really high quality studies. So mm -hmm. Ethan Green's work and his PACT, which is a developmental intervention, that's really high quality. There's, a, there's an example of a single study that has really high quality. Um, I, there are not comparable examples of really high quality research in ABA. So we just don't know. 
What I think is alarming is that um, there are uh, ABA proponents will say this is the intervention with the most accumulated evidence. Yeah. But there's no examination of the quality of that evidence, either the internal validity of the study or what really does this outcome variable tell us? Uh, how how um, important is this thing that they managed to change for the child? I think both of those things have to be examined in detail. So we're actually doing a systematic review of quality now for transition age students um, who are transitioning out of the school system into either employment or post-secondary education. Um, and the quality is really low. I mean, we're using these quality assessment tools and we're examining studies that, that don't even meet basic standards. Um, so I think my questions are why, what will it take for us to get, for us to be completely committed to only producing research that checks every single box on the quality indicator? If it doesn't check all the boxes, let's just not do it. I don't know what the value is of to continuing to accumulate ev uh, um, research evidence that tells us nothing. Yeah, it just floods the field and confuses right. the... So I think that it would be helpful in terms of ABA research if somebody were to sort through it and say, what really do we know? If we were to take quality considerations into account, what can we be certain of? I don't think it's necessarily um, a field that doesn't have any worth, but I would like some sorting out and, and stop like inflated statements that it's the only intervention in town. I don't think it should be, it, it should have the hold on services the way that it does, where for many um, autistic kids, it's the only thing they ever receive. I think that's yeah. inappropriate given what we know about the evidence. Yeah, and the follow-up question to that was, uh, is the ABA field worse with some kinds of interventions or others? And I think you kind of answered that already, but. Well, worse in terms of, Quality. So then they say, is research on ABA as much affected by this as something like teacher asserts? Um, well, it's it's hard actually to compare. It's like apples and broccoli because <laughs> because um, something like so so teach I think had one study in our group design study. There there is, is not nearly as much research on something like teach. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to make those comparisons. Um, but if, if you want to look at it the other way and say which fields actually have really good high quality data, uh, it's not ABA or teach, you know, it's developmental interventions yeah. uh, that have really good examples that you look at and you're like, this looks pretty good. I don't have a lot bad to say about this intervention. And interestingly, those studies tend to make very modest claims. They don't say we've done it. Um, you know, we have the best supports there are. They say we need to do more. This mm -hmm has some uh, positive influence, it seems, um, we should try to improve this. Which yeah, seems I, much more fair. Go ahead, Lisa. I, I Sorry, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, science is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it does have built in some provisions that, uh, you know, fuel criticism, constructive criticism, and progress is based upon that constructive criticism. And this is something that I have uh, been, you know, I, I have had trouble with in the field of autism because uh, in, in the interventions particularly, because the criticism, constructive, constructive criticism is not part of that model. And so they try to uh, hide everything that is uh, potentially negative about what they're doing. So if you do that, there's no way to improve because you improve measuring error and minimizing that error or aiming for change that uh, strives for that kind of error uh, dampening. And, and so, um, you know, it, it would behoove everyone to actually look at the one model that works at the end of the day which is the scientific method. The scientific method is not perfect, but it does tell you, you know, it does give you a prescription of how to go about measuring things, uh, you know, hypothesizing things that are falsifiable so that you measure and you falsify and you build uh, upon layers and layers of um, stuff that has been criticized that you have been, you know, and then you, you find what works. Um, and I don't see that, unfortunately, in, these, in this field. However, having said that, um, 
there is a distinction we have found through surveys and through um, uh, you know these these uh, and polls and and focus groups and so forth in the center that there is a distinction between the practitioners that have private practices and very much want change and want positive change and want you know they are the own critics and the practitioners that are based on, on the school system where everything is already covered or guaranteed and there is no incentive for change so the ABA providers that are in the private sector are actually quite progressive, in my opinion, and are at least the ones I have uh, interacted with and are willing to, you know, to change uh, the way things are done. But that's in the terms of services, you know, practices. Uh, we're talking about research itself. So maybe it is the case that researchers would uh, would need to actually go to the to these this crowd of private practitioners that have an incentive to change and, and to actually find out what's wrong with what they're doing to improve what they're doing so the families are uh, more satisfied and so forth. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I also think that um, having a set of clinicians who are only trained in a single approach is problematic because they're always gonna recommend that approach. So. Right seems like it would make more sense if we didn't have that kind of model where there was a variety of different ways of thinking about um, how you would provide a service and then you can really actually select among you know what makes most sense um, yeah and that I think that's a great point because even in the school system that can happen when uh, say a behaviorist is part of an IEP team and they are only suggesting ABA for that child, that is also a conflict that right. no one is looking into or doing anything about. And one, um, Eric Warwick had commented, um, what implications do you think your study has for IEP advocates and others providing advice and technical assistance for parents of autistic children? I think that's such a good question. And again, I don't, I, I you know, I, I, um, my uh, teaching life, I teach prospective special educators and, and I teach this in my class and I tell them this is the most depressing class you're gonna take because I'm gonna tell you that all of the things you've been given, um, they don't work and they have all of these issues and you're gonna learn about how to read research with a very critical eye and you know read most things and just get mad and rip them up at the end. <laughs> so I, I do think that some of this critical um, um, framing of looking at your choices is good. You know, I think that te um, giving a, a variety of stakeholders the tools they need to be critical and saying there's all kinds of different conflicts of interest out there. There's things that aren't reported. There's, you know, mistakes and in intervention designs. You should be critical. You should be very skeptical. People should have to really win you over and, and, and um, to tell you that something works or doesn't. And if you don't feel right about it, don't do it. Yeah. So I feel like that kind of I, I think that my students, I think that I do win them over and say, and, and they appreciate saying, uh, having some skills to be critical and to, to say that just because something is packaged to me in a manual that looks nice, doesn't mean that it actually has some kind of benefit. It might not be worth my while. Um, so I, I think that kind of critical um, uh, way of looking at different uh, options is, is appropriate and it's something that families can learn to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's it's being critical of, of everything that you mentioned and also questioning what does it works mean? Exactly. What does evidence-based mean? Because yeah. there's a lot of evidence that doesn't really qualify as much. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have a really good comment that I would, I guess, leave as my last thing. But uh, so I'll read that to you, and then maybe if you have any final thoughts, you and you and um, Liz would love to leave us with. <laughs> um, so it says um, we need to stop thinking from Jenna Lorenko. We need to stop thinking in terms of interventions and start thinking in terms of accommodations and support for autistic people. I like it. I, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Start calling them interventions. They start to be a brand. Um, that's probably not an appropriate way of thinking about it. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, it should be, the word should be changed to be uh, switched to, to the accommodations and the support that they need. Um, interventions uh, implicitly 
uh, at the moment have a goal that somebody set up arbitrarily because they thought that that's what they should be doing, uh, that, that uh, they should modify behavior in a way that is compliant to what they say is the norm. Uh, and that's a wrong concept altogether. It's arbitrary in the, in the first place, but what is to say that what you think is the best for this child is actually harmful and, you know, and what you think your culture, your social culture should be about is not. You actually did wrong if you look in the, in the universal way that humans interact or, you know, accept each other or, or ideally would accept each other and so forth. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree that that word should not even be part. It's unfortunately it's part of our vocabulary. So to communicate, that's one limit. Um, we had uh, to come up with a style guide for communication uh, that Jen put together in collaboration with parents and the NIH is on our website. And uh, I was just I was to add that um, Dr. Bottom of Butel's paper is on there as one of the resources. Yeah, <laughs> about avoiding ableist language for research. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely uh, learned from you and, uh, you know, and that this should continue. It's a, it's a conversation that you, you started as a uh, trailblazer, as a pioneer of this and with Michelle Dowson and it, it opens now Pandora's box. And so now we have to make good use of it and um, adapt everything that we, it's, it's an overhaul that we need to do, it adapt everything, rethink everything. It's a paradigm shift, uh, really. And it's a good time for it because uh, it's, it's happening in many areas of autism research that people are realizing, oh my God, uh, this is all, we need to rethink the whole thing and, and start over. Uh, so it's a, it's a good time, I think, for autism. Yeah, I agree. I was going to close by saying that um, I'm an optimist, even though um, some of my recent studies, you wouldn't think so. But I, I agree. I think people's minds are changing. I think there's like a new crop of researchers coming out um, that are, are very easy to kind of um, convince that these things do need to change and they're excited to be involved in changing it. Yeah. I just I want to thank all of you because this is this is so important to everyone's life and everyone's well-being in the community. And we need you brave researchers. And I'm just so appreciative. So thank you so much. Keep the amazing work coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. This was this was such an excellent um, opportunity to, to share with everyone. And I'm so glad that you um, found this work helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you.